Right. Well, thank you for um, giving me the chance to speak this morning. Um, I've got quite a lot that I want to pack in in 15 minutes, so I'm going to gonna motor forward. Uh, just to say that um, I'm not a, an expert on, on race, and um, but uh, as Melody already mentioned, I grew up in Madagascar and I, I was white in a country where there really weren't very many uh, white people in the 80s. It's a very remote place, Madagascar. And so I've been aware of my own kind of whiteness and the, the power of being white in, in, uh, globally from a, a very young age. And it's only recently that I've been able to kind of articulate that with reference to climate change. And for the last two or three years, I've been working on a, a book, which a couple of you have actually seen already. It's called Is Climate Change Racist? This is the draft. It's not published yet, but we're working on that. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, what I want to present today is basically um, from that. And I want to start off with um, this, a couple of maps. So this is the first one I want to show you. Now what this shows you is uh, CO2 emissions per capita. So this is where in the world people have the highest carbon footprints. So red shows that you have a high carbon footprint and are therefore more responsible for climate change. And uh, the darker the green, the less the citizens of those countries have contributed to the climate crisis. Now this map's very slightly out of date and China should be darker than that, but I wanted to use this one because of the, the colors that are in it. Um, and because of this second map, which is this one. So this one shows climate vulnerability. So in this, the greener the country, the less vulnerable they are to climate change. And those orange to red countries are uh, at greater risk from climate breakdown. So those are the countries we can consider the front line of the climate emergency, if you like. And it's not hard to see why it would be a greater risk across the equatorial region. Those are hotter countries. Naturally, the prospect of global warming is going to be more scary if you live in Sudan than if you live in Sweden. And if we put the two next to each other, then you can see that there is, um, they're almost negatives of each other. In the first, there's this green band uh, across the middle <clears throat> on the right there, and that's almost sw swapped over. And in, the, in that second map on the left there, uh, it, it's red across the middle. And what this shows you is that there's a very stark disconnect between the causes of climate change and its consequences. So those who are most responsible for damaging the atmosphere face lower risks. And the greatest dangers fall on those who are least responsible. And this is the injustice of climate change. Now, if we take a look at those two maps side by side and we consider income, the countries with the highest per capita footprints tend to be richer. And we know that's um, because you, people who are richer, they can afford to fly more and drive more and consume more and so your footprints are bigger. So the richest have a disproportionate impact. And although they're most responsible, the richest are also least vulnerable because uh, you are more likely to live in a temperate part of the world where the weather is less extreme, but also you have the money to protect yourself. And should the worst happen, you have the money and the resources to rebuild afterwards in ways that others don't. So climate change is predominantly caused by the richest and it's mainly suffered by the poorest. And that's the economic injustice of climate change. And um, I, I want to point out Madagascar here because uh, this is the country where I grew up, my, my homeland in some ways. Um, and on that uh, first map on the right there, you can see in the Southeast uh, of Africa, it's dark green people of Madagascar have contributed almost nothing to global climate change and yet you look on the other map and it's dark red and they're actually in the top 10 most vulnerable countries in the world and you know, this is a place that I love that was my home and more than anything else it's that injustice that motivates my own climate activism. Now if you look at that map a third time and this time we consider race. In that map on the right there where people have the highest carbon footprints they're clustered in the global north, along with Australia and a couple of other places. It's hard to escape the idea that actually the places most responsible for climate change are predominantly white majority countries. Uh, the emissions from China uh, today complicate that if we just look at uh, current emissions. But if we look at it historically, then overwhelmingly, the cumulative total emissions uh, are skewed towards the global north. <clears throat> 
And that inequality is much more clear cut if we look at that other map and we look at who is most vulnerable and it's very clearly people of color. And you have that band of red going from the Caribbean and through sub-Saharan Africa and into India and into um, East Asia. Um, where the climate suffering will be greatest is among the black populations of Africa. And this is the racial injustice of climate change. Let me say a little bit more about that word climate suffering, <clears throat> because we don't talk much about the fact that uh, climate change is ultimately going to be about suffering. One of the people who did say something about this is John Holdren, who was the climate advisor to Barack Obama. And a few years ago, he said this, we basically have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're going to do some of each. The question is what the mix is going to be. The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. And it's a very stark assessment. You know, this is suffering that's gonna come from drought and from famine and from hunger and from the pain of watching the people you love go through those things. There'll be losses from floods and storms and the destruction of homes and gardens and possessions and what you've worked for. But there'll also be losses from lost landscapes and geographies and cultures and traditions. And along with all of that, there's the, uh, the mental health damage, uh, the depression and the, the PTSD and potentially the suicides. And so when John Holdren says, we're going to do some of each, who does he mean when he says we? Because there will be a lot less white suffering than black suffering. And there's a flip side to climate suffering, and that is climate privilege. To be climate privileged is to be untroubled by climate change, to have no personal experience of its negative effects. Climate privilege is when you can think about the climate emergency as purely an environmental issue, and you frame it in terms of polar bears <laughs> and coral reefs, or when you understand climate change as a matter of economics and as a market failure, perhaps. Um, or when you think that it's mainly something that will affect future generations. And if you've never experienced climate change as harm, as loss, as injustice, or as violence, then you have a degree of climate privilege. I think most of us, many of us, would have to say that we are climate privileged in that sense. And that's not our fault. That's the way the world is. It's what we do about that that matters. Many other people, of course, have experienced climate change as all of these things, and it's a very clear and present danger and it's a matter of survival. When we talk about white privilege, it's the white privilege is the freedom from the negative effects of racism. And male privilege is freedom from the negative effects of sexism. So climate privilege would be the freedom to talk about climate change in the abstract. You know, the luxury of holding it at arm's length because it doesn't affect me, at least not yet. And when you think about it, there's a big overlap between white privilege, male privilege, and climate privilege. And research into climate skepticism shows that denying climate sci science is much more prevalent among white men. And of course it is, because they're the most likely to benefit from the world as it is. If you're on the winning side of all these structural inequalities, it can be very hard to acknowledge those inequalities. And let's turn to structural inequality for a moment, <clears throat> because uh, there are basically three kinds of racism, and this is important to, to talk about. When most people talk about racism and when it comes up in conversation, we're often talking about racial prejudice. And this is the, the racism uh, of, of the actions and opinions of racists, if you like. Uh, and very few people openly identify as this kind of racist because it's obviously uh, socially unacceptable. Um, and if that's our only understanding of racism, then it's very easy to come out with glib statements like we hear from politicians sometimes when they say things like Britain isn't a racist country. But there's a second form, which is institutional racism. And uh, this is the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture or ethnic origin. And the idea of institutional racism was coined by Charles Hamilton and Kwame Toure back in the 60s. And the example they gave is when somebody throws stones at a black family's house, that's individual racism. When that family can't get a mortgage to buy the house in the first place, that's institutional racism. And there's a third kind, which is even bigger, and that's uh, structural racism. <clears throat> 
And these are the patterns of disadvantage that emerge from the overall functioning of a system. And they're often accumulated over centuries. This is inequality at its broadest and at its most invisible because it unfolds through the structures of the global economy. It's, some people call it racism without racists because it's so embedded and hard to see. The problem with structural racism or, or systemic racism, it's sometimes called, is that it, the explicit prejudice might have happened a long time ago and it doesn't need visible racists to perpetuate it. But as the American sociologist Howard Winand writes, uh, racism must be understood in terms of its consequences, not as a matter of intentions or beliefs. So this you know, climate change is, is a structurally racist issue because there's no committee of white people sitting around planning to oppress Africa through climate change. But we can identify racism through its outcomes. And this is important because it's very easy when people start talking about race to leap to the defensive and say, well, I'm not racist. And we can't say that white people are all racist. But structural racism isn't about that. It's about the outcomes, not about the intentions. Um, we're talking about something which is structural because it's historical. And there's a very clear line through history, actually, going from slavery and through colonialism and empire and to climate change. When school children learn about the Industrial Revolution, it's often taught through the lens of technology. And the heroes of the story are the engineers and the inventors, and the people who are developing coal power and building factories and so on. But the bit that we ignore is where the money came from to build those factories. And the reality is that it came from slavery. When slavery was abolished in 1833, the slave owners, these are the slave owners, not the slaves, were compensated for their loss. And the treasury compiled a record of who owned slaves and how many so that they could pay this compensation. And these very careful records were not available to the public until 2013 when they were published. And they're all available online and you can go and look at them. And they show slave ownership and the other interests that those slave owners had. And what we, show, what we see is that the profits from slavery were plowed into building railways, building industry, and into banking, which funded all of those things. So the capital for the Industrial Revolution came from slavery. And then the raw materials for industrialization, cotton in particular at first, came from the empire and from colonialism. And the long-term environmental effects of industrialization through climate change in particular, get dumped back on black and brown people at the end of the process. And so racial injustice runs all the way through this. There's a story of white power taking what it wants, first people and then land and resources and then the atmosphere. Now, the racial dimension of climate change isn't something that comes up very often in mainstream debate. And it remains kind of in the margins um, among academic texts and among activists as well. And uh, a recent survey from Christian Aid revealed that the majority of British people are unaware that climate change affects people of colour most. In fact, a lot of people get it backwards. And this point might be because um, events such as the Australian bushfires get a lot more attention than um, storms and disasters and floods and so on in places like Africa and the Caribbean. And it skews people's view of who the victims are. And so you end up with this view that 31% of people think that white people are most affected by climate change. Now, a majority of black respondents did know which way this goes, which is interesting to note. So there's this huge racial injustice that most people are completely unaware of. And some people might say that it's actually better that way. Uh, I was told this earlier today in, in another conversation, uh, someone who was telling me that I should just get on with dealing with climate change and maybe it would be easier for everybody if it wasn't racialized because that makes it divisive. And the trouble with that view is that racism has already shaped the world's response to climate change and it will continue to do so. So to give one specific example, the decision to focus on two degrees of warming rather than 1.5 our world leaders stopped and thought about that and decided that 1.5 degrees, keeping it within 1.5, should be a stretch goal, something that we aspire to, but not essential. But who's most harmed by that? And the answer is that it's going to be small island states and sub-Saharan Africa. So apparently protecting those people is a stretch goal and an aspiration. We hope we can do it, but it's not going to be considered essential. And there's no other word for that. That's racist. And remember, with systemic racism, we're talking about outcomes, 
not intent. It doesn't mean that all our world leaders are racist, although we could probably all name some that are. So we have to talk about climate and race because otherwise racism is going to continue to shape the outcomes of climate change. If we don't deal with this and if we don't find ways of dealing with this, then ultimately millions more black people will die and will suffer than white people. And this isn't gonna go unnoticed by history. Future generations will look back on this the same way we look back at slavery and say, how did people think that was okay? And why was the church so silent on this? This is a major moral issue, I think. On the positive side, this has been highlighted, this, this connection between race and climate, it's been highlighted by groups like the Sunrise Movement in the US and the Green New Deal. And they're showing how the fight for a sustainable world can go hand in hand with the fight for social justice. And our response can prioritize the needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable. And we can create a fairer world at the same time as we create a more sustainable world. I want to give the, the last word uh, to a black marine biologist and climate campaigner called Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who says to white people who care about maintaining a habitable planet, I need you to become actively anti-racist. I need you to understand that our racial inequality crisis is intertwined with our climate crisis. If we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. And that's where I want to leave it for now.